In the past few years, she's been using her creative talents as a content creator on various social media platforms. Her hope is to educate the public about the field of neurosurgery and to inspire young healthcare professionals. Believe me, you're succeeding at that. <laughs> um, she has been named to several top doctors under 40, and 40 under 40, sorry, lists over the years, and was honored as one of Atlanta Magazine's Women Making a Mark in 2023. And I won't go through all of her professional affiliations, but I can say that she is no doubt a sensation on TikTok and other forms of social media, and we are delighted that she could complete her surgeries today in time to come and be with us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wow, I'm kind of embarrassed. <laughs> um, thank you guys for having me. Um, I am just honored to be here to talk to all you guys today. I actually became kind of affiliated, I've taken on in the Bernal family um, this past summer. I um, participated in Dancing for a Cause, which is a local dance event to raise money for charities. And Maria reached out to me on Instagram and she said, um, I, I, I think I posted something about having trouble finding um, somewhere to practice, and y'all, I'm not a dancer, so um, I, uh, she let me um, practice in the Brown Dance Studio. I got to know her very well, and um, it has really been um, quite a joy getting to uh, know this community, and I'm just honored to be here today um, to talk to you guys. So I'm a little... Um, a little nervous um, it's because I'm used to talking in front of my phone so um, so yeah but uh, I was trying to figure out what to talk about and um, I came up with just talking about being authentic authenticity in medicine um, and it's gonna be as authentic as possible today because uh, I was on call last night and uh, I got about one hour of sleep I had to do two emergency craniotomies in the middle of the night so um, if I stutter on my words or have trouble finding speech, you know why, because I'm very sleep deprived today. So anyway, um, but um, yeah, so I know the theme of this conference is authenticity, alliance, and advocacy, and I think all of those are of utmost importance, not only in medicine, but just in life in general, and that's kind of been my, um, kind of my, you know, passion in, in teaching about um, all these things on on my platform. And so if we talk about the definition of authenticity, it, to be authentic is to be exactly what is claimed, to be tr fully trustworthy and according to the fact, basically being yourself. And I think we can all um, uh, trust ourselves to be as authentic as possible because it makes you who you are. So I'm just going to talk today about my story and how I got here today because it certainly I never would have envisioned myself to be here talking in front of you guys today. Um, if I uh, looked 30 years ago or even five years ago. So, um, so I um, wanted to kind of use authenticity as a staple in my development as a person and um, as a leader. So as she said, I um, was born at Northeast Georgia Medical Center. Um, I, was, I was back in 1980, I'm dating myself, but uh, it was a small shell of what it was today where I practice. And, um, my mom was 20, my dad was 21. Um, they were children, really, having a child. Um, and they didn't really have careers. They didn't even know what to do with their life. Um, my mom sewed clothing. Um, and they started trying to find something to do with their lives. They had a child. They needed to uh, find something to make money. And so they began going to garage sales and buying stuff to repair and resale. And that's how they started um, um, raising me uh, and their family together and they would buy like broken washing machines repair them resell them broken bicycles all these things and what they noticed was bicycles really uh, sold um, whenever they found a broken bike repaired it that thing would turn around like that so if you were driving down Dawsonville Highway on coal by Coles you see that big bike shop bike town USA that is my uh, father's business <laughs> And um, that was 44 years ago when I was a baby. They developed uh, that business because of uh, because that that was their uh, kind of their passion. Um, their my my parents' relationship was strained. Um, they're young adults. They had a new kid, a new 
career, new business, it didn't work out um, for them, and they got divorced, and my mom raised me as a single mom for six years, and um, she didn't really know what she wanted to do, um, so she she got a job in the Hall County Jail, which is a couple blocks from here, and or used to be anyway, and she worked in medical records, and she filed records, and um, she really kind of loved law enforcement. That kind of exposed her to uh, to what it meant to be in law enforcement, and she started from the bottom. She worked in medical records, she became a 911 dispatcher, and then she went on to become a jailer, so she took care of, of people in jail, and then, and then she kind of uh, wanted to do more and more. She became a, sh a deputy sheriff, and, um, and she worked, I just remember her working all the time. She worked day shift, night shift, all shift, um, and she, she came home and she had her bulletproof vest on and her, her gun, her police radio. I was listening to all this stuff and I just thought, wow, she is such a badass. Like, <laughs> I, I want to be like her. She, and, and the, in the nineties, women were about 10% of all law enforcement officers. They were very rare and still are very rare. So she was in a male dominated field and she would always talk about what it meant to, to be a woman in the field and her experiences and things that were said to her and how she would react to it. And, um, you know, I was, you know, I think anybody that has children, you use your children to kind of talk through your thoughts and that's what she did with me. And so I'd always just listen to her and I'm like, wow, I can't believe people would talk to her that way. And she had to earn her respect and she did. She, she uh, advanced in her field. She was, well, she was a, uh, one of the founding members of the Hall County Dive Team. She was on the Honor Guard, and she was thriving and rising her career. Um, <clears throat> so um, I was at the, about the same time I was 13 years old. I was about to start high school, and I um, wasn't sure what I wanted to do in my life. I think most young girls, at that, that's a time where you start thinking, okay, what am I going to do when I grow up? And um, I thought, oh, maybe I'll be like my mom, and maybe I'll be a police officer, maybe, maybe I'll be a baseball player, because I loved softball. <laughs> I, um, I was like the nerd, overweight girl, had red hair, I stuck out like a sore thumb. I didn't have a lot of friends, no boys ever really cared about me. But I did find solace in ball. I love softball, that's where I thrived, it's where I felt like at home. Um, and so, <clears throat> two weeks before I began high school as a freshman, I was a really good ball player. So I was trying out for the varsity softball team as a freshman. And the night before tryouts, my mom worked the night shift. And that night was the most pivotal event in my life. I'm probably going to get emotional now, so just bear with me. But um, <clears throat> So my mom went to work that night. And she, um, she spoke Spanish. So she worked in the hardest part of town. Um, there was high gang activity at the time, and her patrol car was shot at. She ran off the road, hit a tree, and was instantly paralyzed. Um, so I remember waking up that morning because I had softball tryouts, and um, and my aunts came in to wake me up, and I thought, well, that's kind of weird because my stepdad or my mom would have woke me up to take me to um, to ball and. Um, my aunt said, we got to go to the hospital. Your mom's been in a car accident. So we went up to the hospital. I missed tryouts that morning. And I remember walking into Northeast Georgia Medical Center and um, being outside of the intensive care unit. And Dr. Mahana, if any of you guys are from Gainesville, you know Dr. Mahana is one of the original neurosurgeons in the community. He was her doctor, and he came out to us. And I don't remember anything of what happened that day other than he looked at us and he said, she's broke her neck, and she's never going to walk again. And um, I just, that stuck with me, and I'm like, I can't be right. Um, my mom is badass, like, no, she's got to go back to work. So that, <clears throat> that was hard. Um, the next few weeks were very hard. She went through surgery, recovery. She had a tracheostomy place because she had a, a high cervical spine injury, and um, she went on to Shepherd for rehab. And I just remember driving back and forth to Atlanta for three months on end of going through rehab with her. And um, it was hard. And I, we had a hard time accepting this. Um, and I um, went to trials. I went back, played ball, did my thing, and I made the varsity softball team. <laughs> so that was my outlet. I, I dealt with all this by, um, by playing softball. And um, my mom came home months later. I... I um, 
I kept thinking, okay, well, I don't want to be a cop anymore because I don't want that to happen to me. So <laughs> what am I going to do with my life? So I, I thought, well, you know, I, I really, I really want to help people like her. I want to I want to this I don't want this to happen to somebody else. I want to fix people like her and I started looking up um, the internet really wasn't thinking I'm just I'm not I'm older than you guys think I am but um, so I there was this thing that I kept researching it's called the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis and it's a division of the Miami University Department of Neurosurgery and and their goal is to develop research to curing paralysis and I'm like that's what I'm going to do I'm going to become a neurosurgeon I am going to do that. And we all have our stories. We all have our passion for doing what we want to do. And all of you guys have your personal story of how you got where you are today. And that was mine. So <clears throat> in high school, I um, became a certified nursing assistant. I wanted to kind of um, learn how to take care of my mom. Um, I worked at restaurants, all-you-can-eat seafood buffets. I worked at my dad's bike shop. And I excelled academically. I've always been um, kind of the nerd. I really liked math and science and um, I knew that I thought I wanted to become a doctor. So I really just kind of studied hard. Um, I graduated salutatorian of my class. I was kind of pissed that I wasn't valedictorian, but, um, you know, so and I thought, where am I going to go to college? So I, I thought I want to go to, I think I want to go to Emory because I want to be close to home and I want to, I want to play softball. I, uh, reached out to and uh, tried out for, um, uh, received offers from many um, schools in the area about softball, but Emory offered me a partial softball scholarship. And um, that's where I wanted to, to go. I, but I looked at the cost. I mean, my mom is a disabled cop. We don't have money. So I, um, I thought there's, it wasn't a full scholarship, so it's still going to be left with quite a bit of money at the expense uh, to go to school. So I started looking at other places, other grants and scholarships, and long story short, I ended up going to University of Georgia because I was able to obtain uh, full ride scholarships uh, for academics. Um, and so that's where I went. And you know, I think we all think we, we, where we want to be in our life, but I think you just have to know that life guides you where you're supposed to be and takes you in that direction, even though you think looking forward to maybe that's not where you want to be and you're disappointed, but that was where I was supposed to be. So. Went to University of Georgia. I graduated um, top of my class, and I uh, matched to the Medical College of Georgia um, through the early, uh, or accepted into the Medical College of Georgia for medical school. And um, I started visiting the Department of Neurosurgery. Really wanted to get some mentors, and I started looking around. I'm like, you know, I, there's nobody that looks like me. There's no women around here. Every single person in the department and residents are all men. Um, not that that was a bad thing, but you want somebody that you kind of resonate with, somebody you can find, that you can look up to, that you can talk to. Um, so I just, I used my mom as my sounding board because she knew what it was like to be in this kind of situation. And I found mentors um, and um, I found, you know, men that supported me and knew my passion and my mission and they helped me do research projects and and kind of find my way and those people that didn't believe in me and trust me there's plenty that told me that you shouldn't do this you can't raise a family you can't be a surgeon um and i just kind of you know try to tone those people out um as best you can right but um so as i went through went through medical school i um i also tutored and mentored um, people in anatomy and, and um, was always been very passionate about teaching and I um, interviewed at residency programs and what I just tried to tell myself and uh, all these programs is try to be myself what what drives me what makes me different than any other applicant out here um, and what makes me different is my story my passion for what I want to do even if my, maybe my scores are or better or worse than this candidate next to me, they don't have the story that I have and the passion that I have. So <clears throat> I use that as a way of making me stand out amongst the crowd. So that day came March 15, 2007. Today's March 15, today is match day. 17 years ago I matched. Um, and if you don't know what the match process is, to summarize it very briefly, it's where medical students find out where they're going to do their residency, and there's no choice in the matter. You, you apply your specialty, and um, it's kind of like, kind of like the NFL draft. So like, <laughs> like, you know, you just like are told where you're going, and that's it. So um, someone compared to that and made me laugh. Um, <clears throat> so, so yeah, so I opened this letter up, and um, I thought I wanted to be somewhere. And I opened the letter up, and the letter said Duke Neurosurgery. And I'm like, like I should be like shocked, right? I should be overwhelmed. I was. And 
but it wasn't where I was expecting where I was going to go um, because I wanted to stay really close to home and it didn't happen. But you know what? That was the best thing that ever happened to me. Duke believed in me. They believed I was going to be good enough to be in their program and I was going to shine. And, um, and I think we're all, you know, kind of have those experiences in life and you just have to kind of ride through the. And I am so grateful um, for that opportunity because it really was um, the place that made me be who I am today. And don't get me wrong, residency was um, probably the hardest time I've ever had in my life. Um, I was, you know, I've always been in Georgia, always been close to family, always been close to friends where I could just go home on the weekends. And, and being far away, I was isolated. Um, I use, if you've followed me, I've shared a lot of my stories, but I use eating as a coping mechanism, stress eating. I became really overweight, became very unhealthy. I was working 120 hours a week, and thank God, because I was, I, I didn't, have I, did, I was so alone at home that I didn't have anything else to do so working kind of kept my mind off of things this was before the work hour regulations um, and it was it was hard I was exhausted my colleagues were exhausted medicine at the time and it, and it still is very toxic for trainees um, and, and no one really talks about this side of medical training but it's it's you know it's hard um, I could go on on a completely separate topic about that, but I'll, I won't digress too much. Um, so my passion, I was still, you know, working hard, but passionate about learning, passionate about surgery. And as I grew as a, as a doctor, I really found out that I was, I was good at, at what I took most pleasure is talking to patients, talking to, um, uh, explaining patients' problems to them, communicating with because I, I really, um, I don't like to think that I'm that smart, so I try to, when I'm learning something, I try to break it down like really, really dumb so I can like understand it myself. And so I use that kind of mechanism to like explain things to patients. So I try to take a very complex topic and like explain it like how very, very basically. And that, that really bonded with me with people. And, and I think it kind of set me apart from my colleagues and other physicians. Um, because if you've ever learned neuroanatomy, it's very complicated <laughs> or human anatomy for that matter. So as I progressed as a physician, I was very professionally satisfied, but personally I was still sad. I was alone, I was lonely. Um, and then one day um, that changed for me. I met my husband um, in my third year of residency um, and um, it was finally like, it was, it was just a blessing to find someone that accepted me, that loved me for who I was and supported me. And I never found that outside of my own family. So that was like really a pivotal moment for me. We went on to get married in 2011, and um, I grad was graduating residency in 2013, and so I um, started looking around where we would want to move, and we were both in North Carolina, obviously, and um, I had always told myself, there's no way I'm coming back to Gainesville, because <laughs> I want to come back to Gainesville, so I looked at other places, and I just kept coming back, like, um, you know, interviewed at different places and other jobs, and I just, nothing felt like home, so... Um, I interviewed here at the Longstreet Clinic, and um, I actually took a job here with Dr. Mahana, so the, um, the surgeon that operated on my mom, the surgeon that kind of was at, involved in the most pivotal event, now became my partner. So um, he's since retired since that time, but um, yeah, so it's kind of a, a cool kind of circumferential story, but um, it was a homecoming coming back, coming back here to take care of you know, the people that I love, my community, people I went to school with, um, people I grew up with, their parents. Um, but I think as you grow as a, as a person, we all have this imposter syndrome. And that I suffered from that tremendously early in my career. Um, I, like, always doubted what I thought I was telling people or how could I possibly do this? How could someone possibly let me operate on them? Like, I, I maybe I shouldn't be doing this. And and I don't know why we do that to ourselves. I there's you know there's some statistics that say 70% of female CEOs suffer from imposter syndrome, and I really think it's higher. I just think the other 30% don't admit it. <laughs> um, but you know, here I am, a Duke trained neurosurgeon, thinking that I can't do something, and I think that's really you know kind of something that we should all internally reflect. That's okay to feel that way. Those feelings are normal. Um, so fast forward, I ended up having. Um, my first child in 2015, um, 
And from the moment I laid eyes on him, there was nothing else that I loved more than in this world than him. But I still felt like undeserving. I felt like maybe I wouldn't be a good mom. Um, mom guilt, if any of you guys are moms, you know the feeling. And it's like imposter syndrome, but the motherhood edition, right? So, um, so you know, and I have the same behavior with my daughter. But I, as I was growing as a as a mom and as a as a as a person, um, something you know, I had to portray confidence to them because that was my job as raising them uh, and support and love and the same things that I provided to my patients. Um, And so that is kind of how led me to kind of grow out somewhat of this imposter syndrome is trying to to do the things I did with them the day I do for my patients to do for myself. Um, And I'll just say motherhood has probably been one of my most favorite journeys in my life. Um, So I'm going to switch gears a little bit of social media and leadership. Um, As I continued growing in my um, practice and my family, the one thing I really missed was teaching. I taught medical school. I mentored people. Um, I taught my patients, but I just I didn't have any students here. We don't have medical students or anything like that. So I um, it was during the pandemic. It's kind of bored, uh, and um, uh, you know people were not coming to the doctor. Um, and I used my social media as an outlet. It's kind of like I don't know. Was, I just started posting some videos just because, mostly because it entertained myself. Um, And um, I found a way to relate to my audience like I relate to my patients, be relatable, be relevant, be authentic. And um, as I began to share my message, um, it seemingly resonated with people. Um, I taught, I showed things about my kids, motherhood, humor. I rely on humor a lot, it gets me through the rough days. Um, if, and if you're in healthcare, I mean, really, we survive on dark humor. Um, so as, as, I, as my platform continued to grow, I, my confidence began to grow. My leadership skills grow. I read the comments, um, good and bad. I won't go out there. But uh, I learned, like, what other people felt to me and, like, how they would interpret my message. And it, it's really helped me kind of grow as a person, too, because... Some things you portray that you really want to say a certain way and it may come across something differently. So it's always kind of good to see both sides of how you may uh, come across to people. And not only do my message reach my patients, which is honestly originally what I was kind of intending it, it began to reach like complete strangers, like all of you guys, or not a lot of you guys. But um, anyway, we, we want to be relatable so people can trust our expertise to make good decisions and I, and I think this is kind of in life in general. You have to be a good communicator to relay information, to make it understandable. Um, you have to be a good listener. You need to um, to to know, understand the situations and the challenges that are ahead of you, so you know how to deal with them. And you have to be relatable. You have to know that whoever you're talking to is going to listen to you and want to take your advice. Um, and and you know I say that as a physician, but I really say that as a person with anybody that you talk to. And what really should kind of come through is, is your passion, uh, your reason for being here at that moment. Your connection will only be greater if people truly understand why you're here and the message that you're trying to come across. So all of these things have really helped me understand how I can be a more relatable human being, an educator, and a motivator. And I think my experience in teen sports has also helped me become a leader and a good teammate. And I think... Uh, you're only as strong as your weakest teammate. And when I say teammate, uh, you know, sports team, but really the team is who you affiliate yourself with, your family, your friends. And, and you're only going, you, you have to grow your team and support your team to be the best in the game. And your team is your support system. You channel your efforts into supporting those that support you. That, uh, and you are the leader of your team. No matter if uh, you're... You um, want to make sure that everyone functions seamlessly, and if someone is struggling, find a way to support them because uh, you want to help every member of your team grow. So um, I kind of want to end um, with a song. Hopefully this isn't too cheesy, um, but um, I'm not going to sing. Trust me, no. don't worry. <laughs> I heard them sing out there. I'm not like that. Um, I tried out once for a high school course, and I got caught, and it was devastating, so I won't try to sing, I promise. 
Um, <clears throat> so anyway, it's by B.B. Rick. So it's one of my daughter's favorite songs, and she we, she makes me listen to it in the car every single morning. Um, so I know the lyrics, and I'm not going to sing the lyrics. I'm just going to read the lyrics. But anyway, here we go. So um, I'm tired of my thoughts. They weigh me down. It feels like I'm drowning. I'm tired of my flaws. They fill me with anxiety and doubt. Honestly, I'm done with hating pictures of myself and trying to be like everyone else. I want to be like, I want to look like the girl in the mirror. I want to act like and dance like no one's watching her. I could try to be just like you, but I want to be like me, the girl in the mirror. So let's all be the girl in the mirror. Be confident, be powerful, be authentic, be you. And we can only uplift others if we uplift ourselves. So thank you.